Um, Binyamin is a research excavation archaeologist, which means he's actually in the field, right? To put it uh, simply, for the Jerusalem region at the Israel Antiquities Authority since 2008. Now, I actually got to meet uh, Binyamin many years ago at one of his digs uh, that he was supervising in Jerusalem, but he's currently now a PhD student. At that time, I don't even think you had a bachelor's degree in archaeology. You were working for the Rashid. Did you have a bachelor's degree, Binyamin? I, I did. I, I made. I uh, came to Israel with a bachelor's degree. I was work, hadn't uh, started my master's yet. I gotcha. And so um, Binyamin uh, was actually uh, out in the field, and we get, we got to know each other. And uh, I think the next time some years went by, we, uh, we met at, an, at his excavation outside of Beit Shemesh, which is really a, a, a fantastic excavation. It's one very exciting. It's not my period. I'm more focused on the Bar Kokhva period and, and post second, right, right after the destruction. But um, he's digging a Byzantine church, which is a very important site. Maybe he'll say a couple words about that. Um, but he's now working on his PhD in Beersheba and studying the evolution of ho holy sites in the Holy Land from the Byzantine period until the early Islamic periods. He recently completed an MA degree at Bar Ilan University and published a thesis on Beit Natif lamps and molds and their implications regarding lamp production in Eretz Israel during the late Roman period. Since the beginning of 2017, Binyamin has been directing the Church of the Glorious Martyr excavation project near Beit Shemesh. So without further ado, uh, welcome Binyamin Storcha. Thank you very much. Uh, uh to David and the land and Barnea for the, of the lands, my, landmines project. Um, I wish I had such a thing when I was a little bit younger because this would have already uh, got me on track with my career before I knew that this was what I wanted to do. Um, I uh, want to take the time uh, to say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to those around the world. Um, I think it's important that we're all on Zoom and with the click of a button, we can be international and see so we can uh, make this limud or our studies for the Rafua Shlema of uh, people who actually brought us together. Um, the global community has never been closer, um, a sort of a positive um, wake effect of the COVID virus, um, but everyone should have a Rafua Shlema. Now, the topic at hand goes well with Chodesh Kislev, the month of Kislev that just passed us. Um, we can sort of get a Hasidic Vort or a little um, Torah that uh, a Jew, like a car, fills up its battery or fills up the gas tank with the holiday that was, and that takes us to the next holiday. So we're still running on the gas tank from, from Hanukkah, and we'll uh, learn a little bit about Jewish lamps. Uh, it'll be divided into a three sections. The introduction section will just sort of level the playing field with the terminology so that everyone feels comfortable with the topics in, in, in the rest of the lecture. Uh, the second topic will be, or the second major portion of the, the uh, presentation will be presenting my finds from one of my excavations. And the third will sort of be a uh, archeological halachic uh, discussion in search of ancient Jewish lamps and lighting. Now, as you may have been following the news, uh, in reaction to the Hanukkah holiday, um, in Israel, two major lamp workshops were published. Uh, on the right, you can see uh, the Beit Natif lamps. Uh, we will talk about that today. That's an excavation going on by the Israeli Antiquities Authority. And to the left, a opening of a gallery fe uh, featuring lamps and lamp molds that were discovered in Tiberias. These lamps and lamp molds are dated to the early Islamic period and we will not be discussing them. But from these two pictures, you could think that archeologists uncover a lamp workshops all the time, but this is not ex what happens at all. They're very, very, very rare. Um, so let's just dive into the topic. 
Uh, what are the parts of a lamp? So that everybody knows from the top, we have the wick hole, which uh, into which the wick is inserted. Uh, we have the round body. We have the filling hole and the handle. Uh, this is the most basic lamp type. It continues for thousands of years in Eretz Yisrael. Um, so when we talk about the filling hole and the discus, that's this portion around the filling hole. I hope you can see my pointer. Um, uh, this is what most, or in a schematic presentation, this is what the ancient lamp, most of the ancient lamps of Israel uh, look like, but that's not completely true. I would go to the timeline. When do we have the first oil lamps? Uh, the first oil lamps are actually dated to the time of the patriarchs in the Bronze Age. And they're nothing more than a simple bowl that was folded to give four uh, pinched protrusions, the sort of nozzles um, that gets developed later and turned into what's called a saucer lamp in the Iron Age. That's on the top left, the second to the uh, second to the left. Um, you see this pinched saucer bowl. This is what was common during the Iron Age or the first temple period. Now, these bowls were made on a simple potter's wheel. The wheel would turn, they would form the bowl, they would pinch the nozzle, and that's it. Nothing fancy. Uh, the first major innovation we see comes in with the Hellenistic period. Um, the Greeks in, in the area of the Aegean Sea uh, developed the idea of producing lamps and molds. If you could produce a mold, uh, you could like, like uh, Play-Doh sort of um, cast lamps in a vast number and they could be decorated and you wouldn't have to invest great effort into the decoration. Now in Eretz Yisrael, there was a lot of these Greek imported Hellenistic lamps and side to side, we see a, a completely Jewish Hasmonean invention. It's called the uh, pinched lamp or in Hebrew, the Ner Tzavut. Uh, it's the one on uh, the, top uh, the top right. You see the pinched nozzle. Uh, very much representative of the Iron Age. Now the wheel making lamps continues into the Herodian period. We have at the bottom left, uh, to the next, to, to the right of it, you see a discus lamp. These are imported lamps and they were also being produced uh, locally. They feature um, iconography, deep iconography or art for the sake of art. Um, these were imported and locally produced side by side. Um, after the failure of the Bar Kokhva revolt, or the, before the, the, after the destruction of the temple in 70 CE, we see the introduction of the Darom lamp. Now, I remember when I was learning um, ancient Judaism, or, and you see a, a society that's very anti-art, and almost as soon as the, fa the, the, the temple was destroyed, you see an increase in Jewish art. Um, one of the first objects that receive proto-Judaic art beyond ge geometric de uh, design is in lamps. Lamps are a personal item. They're something that are uh, very common, very easy to make. Um, and maybe they didn't have, they were easy to scapegoat around uh, halachic stringencies. Now, in the wake of the Bar, the Bar, uh, Bar Kokhva revolt, we see the development in the late Roman period to very simple pear-shaped lamps. And that gives rise to, the, in the Byzantine period, this sort of radial design Byzantine lamp. Now, that's a lot of information. We could spend a whole semester in a college degree talking about each one of these and what they mean. We do not have time for that. But again, here comes the Hanukkah story. Many researchers have already identified that during the Iron Age, these sort of pinched lamps made out of a, out of, out of a simple bowl um, and the entrance of the Greek mold made lamps, the Hasmoneans decided to have a cultural revolt saying that's not us, this is Greek. The whole Hanukkah story is more than just a re revolt against leadership, it's a cultural war of Hellenism. Now, in order to show that they are the original Jews or to connect themselves to the first temple Jews, 
They make lamps just like they did in the first temple period. This coincides with a number of cultural throwbacks, if you will, um, the revival of the Proto-Hebrew script, writing the God's name, yud ke vav ke with the, pro the Proto-Hebraic script in the Hezmanian period. Uh, burial practices sort of shoot back into the uh, Iron Age burial practices. And again, anyone who's interested into this cultural revolt uh, by the Hezmanians is welcome to uh, look into the... So how do you make a mold for a lamp? Well, in the Roman world, it was common to create a solid archetype. That's what we have in the top left. You have a solid, uh, a solid form that you want to cast. You cast it into a plastic uh, uh, material. That's here, you made this solid lamp. You put it into a, a pliable material. You make the cast the top and the bottom separately. You've now created an upper and lower mold. You put the clay in the, the top and bottom squish it together and voila, you have a lamp. But we don't see this in Eretz Yisrael. Actually, we see something quite unique. That's not how we do it. In Eretz Yisrael, you see lamp molds being made out of uh, blocks of limestone. Uh, they would take the limestone quarried out, drilled or chiseled, and to form the mold rather than forming an archetype. And that served as the mold. Here you can see a picture of two molds that were found in uh, Har Grizim uh, in Samaria. Just to show you that I'm not really lying, here's a <laughs> uh, uh, an example of lamp mold archetypes that were found in Romania. Um, this is quite remarkable because there aren't so many of them. We do have some molds, but we don't have many archetypes. Here at this lamp workshop in Romania, they found uh, something like 30 uh, patrixes and archetypes. Now, to show you that this um, stone mold making is a widespread behavior, here I can show you examples from Kesara that were found and from Shekhin. And those who study the Mishnah should recognize the name of Shekhin as a, already a Mishnaic lamp producer. Um, I'll leave the discussion for Mishnaic lamp producing from Shekhin to the excavators, but nonetheless, a very uh, incredible discovery. Um, Kesaria being uh, on the Northern Israeli coast of the Mediterranean coast, Shekhin being in the Galilee sort of uh, by Nazareth, Nazareth. Now, why stone molds? The Eretz Yisrael is full of stones. I remember when my brother came home from his first year of uh, trip into Israel and he came back, then we had to print photos. Printed photos, we were all excited to see what his trip looked like. And my mom said, why did you photo so many rocks? Well, Israel is very rocky. It's the number one <laughs> natural resource you might as well make something out of it, but that's not completely good enough. During the Second Temple period, you see an, a society because of halachic or um, um, desires to pertain to purity laws to make vessels out of stone. And that stone vessel industry continues all the way until modern day. Here's a picture of a stone craftsman in Bethlehem he was working up until the 70s. I've tried to track this down. Actually, you think his shop closed, but uh, Israel has a long standing history of making use of this chalk. Now, we've got into the finished the introduction part of the lecture, and I will take you to the region of Beit Chemish, uh, where I've been working. Uh, in green, you can see uh, the borders of the modern development. Anyone who's been to Beit Shemesh or is contemplating buying a house in the near future in Beit Shemesh will be in this green zone. This is what was slated to const for construction. Um, it was presented to the, to the Israeli Antiquities Authority uh, in the 1990s. And ever since we've been working to uh, undertake, we've undertaken a number of salvage excavation projects to sort of excavate as best we can the um, in the wake of urban sprawl. Now, the red area, arrow points to a village called Beit Nati. Here you can see uh, the 1948 soldiers approaching the village of Beit Natif. 
Um, after 1948, the village was abandoned, but we know of Beit Natif as not just a small Arab town. In the writings of Josephus, this was one of 10 toparchies, the sort of administrative, uh, administrative units that was a government center. Meaning if you lived in this area and you needed government services, paying taxes, Beit Natif would be one of the 10 places you could go to talk to the government or to get government services. Um, now, every government city has to be on a Roman road or the a network of ancient roadways. Here we can see the Palestine Exploration Fund's map of uh, Beit Natif. It's circled and the red da dashed line follows the Roman road. The Roman road in this section connects uh, Jerusalem to Beit Guvrin through the Ela Valley. The Ela Valley being topographically the easiest uh, region to traverse. And in 1933, um, Dmitry Konstantin Baramki, one of the antiquities inspectors for the British uh, Mandate Department of Antiquities, noticed that there were there was a cistern that contained many lamps and zoomorphic vessels. Now, if you um, when I, be, when I find that when people find out that I'm an archaeologist in America, the first question they usually ask is, so you dig for dinosaurs? Uh, where in Israel, most people say, oh, you're an archaeologist, do you find gold? And if you do, when I work with the workers, they usually say, if we find gold, let's split it 50-50. Well, that actually was true. During the British uh, mandate period, it was very common to uh, hire the workers and split up the treasure. 5050. Uh, and this is exactly what happened. An excavation was undertaken in Beit Natif, and they found a cistern. Inside the cistern, hundreds of oil lamps and figurines. Um, the workers complained they didn't want to work. Uh, they went, they reneged on their 50 50 deal, and the government actually paid to continue the excavation. And here's a look at some of the products that were coming out. Um, oil lamps, terracotta oil lamps, and these zoomorphic and anthropomorphic figurines, both produced in molds. And sure enough, one of the, actually about 1%, so about three or four of the assemblage contain depictions of the ancient, or the, the temple seven branched candelabra or menorah, um, clearly identifying that somebody's making quote unquote Jewish lamps. Now you look at the menorah in the bottom left and you look at these figurines and you say, okay, I get why the bottom left's Jewish, but why, what's the rest all about? Um, it's a question that's still unanswered. We'll, we'll talk more about it. And one of the lamps next to the menorah, you can see has a name, Zanis. This is the name of the lamp maker. It's a Semitic name. It's an Arabian name, probably Zaninos. Um, but more importantly, in this uh, cistern was thrown uh, a collection of stone molds for the lamp making. Here's an example of what was published. When I looked into the archival material, there was about 30 more molds. These have now been published. This was the topic of my uh, MA uh, thesis. Um, so anyone who's interested can look it up. I'm sorry now for this slide. I did not have time to translate it, um, but the Beit Natif lamps have a very wide uh, distribution. They're found from anywhere from Ashkelon to Beit Guvrin, Jerusalem, Hebron, and, and to the area of Nesher Ramle, um, Rehovot, and almost to Tel Aviv. This is the dist distribution area, and we cannot talk about the Beit Natif lamps without mentioning where they find many of them about a kilometer and a half away from the production center. Um, I do have to mention, I forgot to mention that the Paramki excavations became lost. He excavated in 1933 and the Beit Nati, Beit Nati village was um, desolate since 1948 and no one knows where the location uh, of the cistern was uh, until recently. Um, so a, about a kilometer and a half northeast of Beit Natif, uh, there's this twin caves. It's a very important site for those who want to study the Bar Kokhba revolt. It was a hiding cave. But during this period, the late Roman period, 
Lamps were being shoved into crevices into the walls as if somebody was trying to hide something. This activity has been interpreted as pagan usage, but wait, Benjamin, you just said they, they, these are Jewish lamps. Now you have talking about pagan activity. Let's move on where the next largest collection is. Um, here's the Sakelum, the, the small uh, temple found at the Beit Green Theater. Amphitheater, uh, most people get it wrong to tell you the truth. Amphitheater is a round gladiator uh, construction where the theater is a half. So uh, many people in Israel, they think they're going to the amphitheater in Caesarea, but they're actually going to the theater. Um, so amphitheater is for gladiators. This is where gladiators would have fought. And you can see a collection of these lamps that were found in association with these altars and to the far uh, bottom left, you have again, this lamp decorated with the seven branched menorah. What is it doing there? Um, in the uh, north, just north of Hebron, many people don't know it because it's not accessible to uh, Jews today, or it is or maybe one or two, two days a year. Um, there's a site called Ramat Mamre. This is a Herodian complex that was built by Herod. The masonry is very similar to the Temple Mount, very similar the masonry used in the uh, tomb of the patriarchs. Uh, this compound has been excavated. It was excavated in the, the, the late 20s by a, a German uh, archaeologist named Mader. He um, excavated it. it. It turned into a pagan worship center and then a paleo-Christian worship center. And it is even mentioned in uh, Masachet Avodah Zarah is one of the three fairs which Jews cannot participate in because Jews and Christians and pagans were gathering at this site to worship the oak or to, to each one doing its own ritual and homage to the oak of Mamre where Abraham sat and the angels came to visit him. Um, I have never been to this site, but in the uh, southwestern corner, there's a well, and inside the well, we have hundreds of these Beit Natif lamps, meaning, again, we have people throwing away uh, lamps by the hundreds. To look at the figurines, you have men, women, children. Now, uh, side note, the, the world expert in these figurines a professor from Germany by the name of Achim Lichtenberger. And uh, when he came around to publish it, he published, uh, he had very German names for the hair treatments of these women. Uh, Scheitel something, it was a very complex German word, which I didn't understand except for the Scheitel part. And I asked him, why don't you look into the Mishnah? There's descriptions of these hairdresses, Kabul, uh, Vesambuntin. Uh, and I sent him a copy of the what, what children learned in the Mishnah, Mishnah Mitzvah, at the drawn, the illuminated Mishnahs for kids, with pictures of these hair treatments and what a woman could wear on Shabbat. And he was ecstatic. Now, this just enlightens what a tremendous archaeological source we have in the Mishnahic literature. Uh, people who are studying archaeology and are completely um, removed from the Mishnah are taking a lot of things out of context. And in fact, uh, he uh, included some of the Mishnahic references in later publications of this material. Now, to show you some of the iconography, you have horse riders, animals, and some masks, and all this. Here's the professor I was talking about, Professor Achim Lichtenberger. Um, his major theory was that the birds, the uh, women and horse riders, are the continuation of Iron Age uh, iconography. We'd like to think that during the Iron Age, there's um, a ban on making uh, figurines and imagery. Um, this shouldn't surprise any Tanakh, avid Tanakh reader, because during Navi times, the Navis are telling the Jews not to, not to do idol worship. Now, you don't have to tell somebody not to do something that they're not doing. Um, the constant reminding Jews not to do uh, 
um, idol worship was because they were, in fact, participating. Um, I think that he has some things correct. I don't think that it's a one to one. I think that the return of the iconography to the region comes through uh, later. Um, um, later peoples who were installed uh, during the Bar Kokhba revolt from northern Syria, and they come and they they have con continued cultural traditions of this iconography. Um, the largest and almost only catch of these figurines is in the Givati parking lot in a major uh, Pristilian villa that was found just to the south of the Temple Mount. Um, inside the house, they have a collection of these figurines and according to the art excavators that these figurines um, probably served as a, a household cult. Now, the Beit Nati figurines it would be enough, Dayenu, that we have one production center, but I excavated a second production center at Churvat Shumela. For those who are seeing the map and uh, fail to uh, understand where it is, just to the north is the southern limits of Beit Shemesh. You can see already the construction um, sort of winding its way around the hills. Uh, at the, the site of Churvat Shumela, I was not the first excavator, the first excavations were done by Yuda Dagan, Dr. Yuda Dagan of the Israeli Antiquities Authority in the late 1990s, where he started to notice large stone walls that were buried in, in terraces. He started to uncover remains of a villa, and I had the pleasure of continuing his excavation in 2014 and, ex, uh, and revealing the Western uh, portion of a villa. Luckily enough for me, there were some nice mosaic floors, a very elaborate building um, that had a complete division between domestic areas and production center. The southern area of the building was used as a lamp workshop producing the exact same products in the exact same manner as the Baramki uh, cisterns. Not to show you some of the molds, uh, also figurines were being produced here. We have the same men and women and boys, some animals, um, but I'd like to call your attention to this um, figurine. It's an arm. He's got some gladiator bands. He's holding a, a uh, handle. And on the backside, you can see a shield. This is iconography that's showing us that we're, co we're connected with this amphitheater gladiator culture. And all of this is in the third, fourth century in the wake of the... Uh, Bar the failure of the Bar Kokhba revolt about 120 years after. During the excavation, we found a brooch, which was enamel and it has a shoe. Uh, this brooch was imported from the Northwestern territories. It probably came with a soldier. So you can ask yourself here on one of the figurines, you can see brooch wearing, what are soldiers doing with all these Jewish lamps? And what is a Jewish lamp then? Uh, here they are, the Beit Natif material, and has produced, I only brought a sampling. These are the depictions of the uh, menorah as they are on the, on the Beit Natif lamps. Notice here you have the incense shovel. Here it is again. You even have a shofar on this one. Um, here's the incense shovel again, and a shofar here. This, this um, idea of the the menorah flanked by the incense shovel and or shofar or um, lulav is a reoccurring uh, theme we see in the mosaics, we see in coinage, we see in medallions, uh, architectural fragments of the late Roman period in Palestine or in Israel. Now, I had the pleasure this year to receive a WhatsApp from a colleague uh, excuse the Hebrew, who sent me a picture. He was excavating near Beit Natif. He found a Beit Natif lamp and said, wow, and, and I wrote to him, wow, 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 amazing, I want to see it. You don't know what you found. He wrote Beit Natif lamp and Beit Natif. I don't think I'm the first one to have found such a thing. Sure enough, he rediscovered 
the cisterns that were excavated in the 1930s. Um, so now we can help to uh, put these cisterns in its context. And I'm telling you all this, in the end, what we see here is not the Jewish lamp. We see the desire for a lamp maker to sell lamps to Jews. He desired to sell lamps to um, uh, pagans. He desired to sell lamps for the people who are throwing hundreds of lamps away into the well and into crevices. It sounds like it's somebody who goes into the uh, plastic, plastic utensil industry. Your customer will always be buying more. They're throwing them away. They're reusing them, or they're not even reusing them. They're, they use them, they throw them into, into this wishing well, into that crevice, into this uh, temple. So being a lamp maker was probably a lucrative business. These cannot be considered truly Jewish lamps. So if we have to search for a Jewish lamp, we need other criteria. And here we can start to use the Mishnah to tell us some things that may not be so clear in the lamps themselves. Now, one thing that the archeology span does show us, let's go back to the second temple period. Here we have the Herodian lamp, which goes with this discus lamp, this being a completely Roman product. We can notice something that jumps out right after, right, right away. The Herodian lamp and these Darom lamps, which are the later continuation, you can see the stylistic uh, parallel between the body and the nozzle, are depicted with the nozzle up. While most of the Roman lamps are depicted with the nozzle down. This is something we see over and over and over and over again, except for some of the local discus lamps, which are produced. Um, this was not uh, my discovery. This has already been mentioned by many scholars. Um, for those who are familiar with Israel, sort of the local twist and something that's a uh, very standardized way of doing something, see it a little bit different. Now you'll notice a, another difference. Notice the size of the filling hole. Filling hole, the filling hole. And here we are. Now we can start to identify certain changes in, in the morphology of these lamps according to Jewish tradition. Here are some uh, first century uh, oil lamps that were discovered at the site of Apollonia. And the excavators there, Oriental, Professor Oriental of Tel Aviv University, realized right away that many of the lamps that he was uncovering have the discus or the center smashed out. Notice that all these lamps have been smashed out. Now that's the area where we're supposed to have some kind of design. Now who's smashing out all of these lamps? Here we go. These are the lamps. Maybe they're a Jewish modification for pagan lamp producers who are uh, producing their products with imagery. And when Jews are receiving them, they are fixing them by breaking it. Um, anyone who's been to Mount Zion may have seen the statue of David. Um, this statue was donated um, and was not received well by many of the people davening or praying at the, so it was repeatedly vandalized where people were uh, snapping off the nose, fixing it uh, halachically so that it's not a statue. And they fixed it a number of times until they realized that we're just gonna leave it. The status quo, you can see King David statue on Har the Mount of Zion in Jerusalem near the, near the tomb of David with the smashed off nose as not to. So maybe this breaking is sort of the smashed off nose. Okay, yeah, it was produced uh, with pagan imagery, but if we break it, it'll be okay. Um, but we, we can see another possible uh, solution in the Mishnah. Ner Shuro Beshemen, this is from the I'm quoting from the Mishnah. Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Eliezer Omer, Bepruta Ktana, a lamp the size of the whole mu uh, must be as such of oil that it will fall through. Rabbi Eliezer says that such a small, that only uh, if a small hole is big enough for a pruta to fall through. This is the uh, Roman lamp with the small fill hole. Apparently, 
that's not big enough to become uh, to stay pure if it's uh, not, not big enough. Apparent, also, many of these lamps were being used as storage piggy banks. Here we can see Rabbi Elazar is more stringent as he holds that the hole must be sufficient to let out a small coin. It seems that, one second, um, they used to store coins even though they continue to be useful until the calm coins fall out. So maybe we have here the first identification of what a, another identification of what a Jewish lamp is. These filling holes, they want larger filling holes. Um, we can look at the Samaritans. Um, not the Samaritans, we have to give another course, maybe another 10 Zoom sessions to talk about what the opinions of the uh, Samaritans are, how they came about. There's a concise uh, description in the Mishnah of the Kutim. Um, these might be the kin, but here, apparently, they are making lamps with menorahs on them, and we wouldn't really call them Jewish lamps. These are Samaritan lamps. They're found uh, where the Samaritans are in here. They're producing lamps, but they did not even cut out the uh, filling hole, meaning the customer who bought the lamp bought it sealed and was intended to smash out the discus himself to prevent any sort of impurity that was passed down from the mold to the lamp uh, by smashing it would be an opening the lamp. Uh, he could guarantee that his lamp would be pure and, um, and not be tainted during the production process. Um, if we have a lamp, then we have to light it with something. So what would Jews be using to light? Um, many congregations in, in um, read this Mishnah Friday night. What do you like? Um, you have a, a whole laundry list here of all kinds of wicks and um, um, oils. We have castor oil, burnt oil, tallow, which is uh, animal fat. Um, of course, the, the halachic ruling here is being talked about Shabbat lamps, uh, but they, again, they wouldn't have used this list if these weren't things that were being lit. Now, um, archeology span in the 21st century has been able to do um, incredible things. One of the incredible things that we're doing is something called residue analysis, where we can take ceramic vessels or pieces of ceramic vessels and extract preserved organic remains from, from the walls of the vessels themselves. And a number of researchers, uh, Devori Namdar, uh, Doron Ben Ami, Moran Khajbi, Nachshon eh, Zanton, Joe Uziel, Yana Chikonovich, and Yuval Gadot, who are all excavating in the uh, Ir David, the city of David, took lamps that are dated from the end of the uh, uh, Second Temple period. They tested what organic materials were being lit. And to everyone's surprise, they found that there was a large percentage of lamps that are being uh, lit by palm oil. Uh, we can look again in the list. Fish oil, sesame oil, nut oil, turnip oil, tar, gourd oil, no, no palm oil. So how, how could it be that we've now found uh, a, a, all this palm oil inside uh, oil lamps, and it doesn't even show up in the Mishnaic uh, documentation. The excavators have related it to um, a story in Masechet Psachim of the Jews of Jericho. Uh, if anyone has any experience with agriculture, the date needs to be um, sort of pollinated by hand. And the Jews of Jericho, one year during Cholomoed, climbed up on the trees. It was the time to po pollinate the trees. And they did something. They did the pollination during Cholomoed. And all of the oil and the trees themselves, all the wood became hekdish, meaning they had to give it to Yerushalayim. And they think that in the end of the Second Temple period, there was an influx of this date products. 
Um, anyone who wants to read, here's the article. It is in Hebrew. They have not published an English report um, on the subject. Now, if we talked about the oil, we need to talk about the lamb, uh, the, the wick. We have a list of wicks. We have uh, lekesh, which is cedar, uncombed flax, raw silk, willow, desert weed, uh, moss, like sort of algae. Um, here is an oil lamp from Qumran with the wick preserved. It's actually made out of palm, uh, palm threads. If you sort of rip, uh, uh, let the, the palm leaves dry and you rip off the a leaf from the, from the bark, uh, you get these thready materials, which could be used apparently as a uh, wick material. We have from the later Byzantine period, uh, two examples, one from Beit Shemesh, this one from Shifta uh, of flax. So flax seems very good. It's in our uh, list. Here's the one from Shemesh. Um, now we'll help to show you some other halachic ramifications. If the oil is not enough, let's talk about how they would light it. Lo yekuv adam shforforet shel beitza v'yemalena shemen v'yitnena al pianer b'shvil shetiyeh menatefet. This is the description. If you look in any Mishnahic description of what this Mishnah means, meaning they would take they would take a lamp. Uh, poke a hole in an eggshell, and it would serve as a reservoir as the la as the lamp would be draining the oil. The oil would drip from the eggshell into the meaning. You could just have a much larger. Uh, you could have a, uh, a longer lasting lamp. But I always ask myself, I have a problem with this Mishnah. Why don't they just make a bigger lamp? Why do you need to make an egg hole? And now the answer, actually, I don't have an answer, but I was reading this Mishnah with my son, and he had a different description. He had in his Mishnah book, a picture of a suspended egg over an oil lamp and dripping into the oil lamp. Then uh, it seemed to be a shidduch, <laughs> looking into some ancient archeological uh, architectural descriptions. I found the exact same thing. Here's a glass oil lamp with an egg on top of it. And in fact, Christians and Muslims in Israel still have this. Here's an ostrich egg being hung over an oil lamp in Bethlehem. And here's a mosque in Turkey that also has a suspended. Now these aren't filled with uh, uh, oil today, but I look at this and I wonder if these oil lamps in the mosques and in Bethlehem, the church are remembering this sort of idea that the Mishnah was telling us to put the egg on top and it would drip. Uh, it seems too good to be true. Um, I have not found any other resources that mention this, uh, these hanging uh, ostrich, ostrich eggs over oil lamps. Um, we'll show you another specified uh, lamp type. The rabbi has decreed that a person may not fill a bowl with oil and place beside it the lamp and place the unlit head of the wick into the bowl so that it draws an additional oil from the bowl. Meaning the same kind of thing with the eggshell, except you're using two, uh, two reservoirs that are ceramic. Uh, excavations at a Byzantine site called Khorvat Uza uncovered this vessel. It is a bowl with a stand. Uh, it would be used as a reservoir for oil, meaning the wick would be entered into here. It would be long enough to come back out the fill hole and wrap down into the bowl, meaning this could last uh, for a uh, significant amount of time. And if you don't want to believe my word for it here, they even wrote for us Shin Bet Taf Shabbat. This is a Shabbat oil lamp from the fifth century, a sixth century that was found in Northern Israel. Um, helps exactly describe what the Mishnah, in my opinion, is talking. Now, um, it is Sunday and we're looking forward to Shabbat. So uh, the next time we light our Shabbat candles, 
Um, we can talk about what's in the Jewish lamp much more than you would have expected. We're continuing traditions um, that are much deeper than uh, just lighting itself. How we light, what we light, where we light are all part of who we are. Um, I, I hope that this uh, um, study through the Mishnah and archeology span will give us a greater appreciation for our traditions and where we are today and how we got there. Thank, Nelman, you, thank you so much. That was fascinating. Uh, there are, are at least uh, a couple of questions that are out there. So um, there was uh, a question. Stuart had a question. Stuart, you want to ask yourself? I think you have to turn on your mic. And if we could see your face, it would be nice. All right. So let's see. Um, look, can you hear me? Yes. I was interested on the swastika design on one of the uh, collections. I think it was found in Beit Shemesh, from the Beit Shemesh co collection. Yes, um, trying to find it. It was near the beginning uh, of the- of the. Yeah, 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 I know ex exactly where it is, just so that we have it in front of our eyes. Here you go, you can see the, the swastikas. Now- Yeah, right. This is the cultural loaded symbol that um, Jews in this symbol um, don't have easy feelings um, since the World War II. But before World War II, this symbol uh, was, was not packed with all the cultural um, associations that we may have. Um, I don't know if it actually has any specific meaning. There are many swastika designs that were even used in Herod's temple. Um, Dr. Orit Peleg uh, from the Hebrew University published the architectural fragments of Herod's temple, what we found fallen down below. And a number of them are decorated with this uh, twirling cross. Um, I think it's, you know, I have a little bit of a of a background in studying the, the swastika and how ubiquitous of a symbol it was. It was found in Troy, and of course, in some some archaeological sites in Israel. And of course, ancient um, swastikas were found in archaeological digs, uh, most prominently in South of America. But it's interesting that. The two swastika lamps here, that that one of them goes one direction, the, the the one in the middle, that's more sort of the standard direction, even though it's sort of a little bit turned. It's not the, the traditional swastika. The one on the left's very interesting because it's sort of inverted in the opposite direction, which is symbol similar to what Yamach Shemo did. He 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 actually chose the swastika design and he inverted it. It, it had been more popularly in the opposite direction and, and, and he, he turned it like the one on the left-hand side. So I, I think that's interesting. Yeah, I will call your attention also to the in, inscribed lamps. Uh, this is actually the mirror image. Here's how it is. Uh, in normal, and then I flipped the image for you mirror here, and also again here, so that you could any Greek readers could read it. We have the zeta, alpha, nu, nu, epsilon, sigma. Um, the mold maker, remember, they're doing this into the stone directly. Here he's writing his name in inverted, twice inverted script, so that it shows up inverted. It's not uh, writing it on the mold and then it would show up because it's still writing backwards. Meaning the guy who's doing all this carving has a mastery of how he's doing it. And I don't know uh, to tell you if the symbol was uh, pleasing to the eye. Here you can see the, this is a, what they call a type one uh, bait natif lamp. He's chosen an array of designs. Um, to decorate his pieces, um, concentric circles, concentric uh, triangles, dots, running patterns. Uh, but I don't know if he uh, 
was influenced by any outside influence um, that would we need to our history. It's very interesting, and thank you very much for your for your lecture. I enjoyed it very much. Any thank other uh, questions or comments out there? Harry, go ahead. Turn on your mic. Yep. Um, we've done some work up in um, Sea of Galilee region, and we're using XRF to identify the um, try to find the source region for the Herodian oil lamps. The idea is that. Bethsaida, as well as some other regions, that you have a local source of clay at Shaquem, where is one source, but then a lot based on the groupings, and we're using strontium and zirconium, we can separate out all those regions. And the idea is that at Bethsaida, as well as other areas, they're going down to Jerusalem and picking up oil lamps and taking them back home. And so one of the questions I've always had, and no one in Israel has been able to answer it, is where is the clay source for the oil lamps that are being sold in Jerusalem? And I would ask the same at your source. You talk about the rocks and how things are being formed, but where is that source for the clay um, in that region? Because I think it's a very interesting question because you need that clay i uh as you probably know uh david dan Bayovich has studied uh the northern um and jerusalem production the northern appearance i'll, I'll call it and jerusalem made uh a knife paired or herodian lamps and yes he came to that same conclusion um moza clay uh, is a is a a gromosol that is as vast uh, appearances around Jerusalem. I think that the convention center, the uh, Binyan uh, Jerusalem Convention Center, has also been working on clay sourcing. So you have a standing tradition to make at least cooking materials um, at the Lifta area of Jerusalem. Anat Cohen Weinberger, who studies petrography of the uh, for the, uh, the the IAA, she bases her studies on thin sections, meaning cutting the pottery very 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 thin and looking then at them through a microscope and quantifying the uh, trace elements. Um, she'll tell you that Moza is very wide and uh, it's not possible. Beit Shemesh sits on the border between Moza clays and Takia clays. Now, can you explain what Takia clays are? Oh, now we need a, ge a, ge a geologist. Um, <laughs> Takia clays, um, all clay is sort of a washed out form of earth, meaning um, impurities um, have sort of leached out of the soil, leaving a very thick a elastic type soil that is good for pottery production. Um, and there are different ranges of different, uh, this is my <laughs> non, this is a very specific field for, for geologists to talk about the clay types. Um, but to mention, you mentioned people going to Jerusalem and taking oil lamps. I know of three or four more lamp production centers around Beit Natif, uh, dated to the Byzantine period. So you have late Roman and then Byzantine production. And somebody asked me, well, the, are they making all these lamps because there's good olive oil? I said, no, they're making all these lamps because there's good clay. Um, but in the Byzantine period, at least church visitors uh, taking lamps as a pilgrim's keepsake is a very common thing. Now, pilgrim behaviors don't change too much. They, um, there have been a number of ethnographic works that are done, studies on what a pilgrim experience is, what they bring along with them, what they take with them, what they leave with them, uh, what they leave behind. Um, and in the ancient period, oil lamps are part of two significant ceremonies. One, ritual lighting at the place you visited. Anyone who's been to the 
Kilula of the Baba Sali, the yort site of the Baba Sali, <laughs> knows about the vast amount of candlelights or uh, uh, Lagba Omer, where the whole mountain in Meron is lit on fire. Um, so that's a ritual that you do at a place by candlelight. There's another one which uh, is ongoing today um, of taking lamps home with you. Um, I would not pu push off the idea or make uh, light of the idea that Jews are going to the temple and they are bringing uh, oil lamps home. Now, I don't know if this is true, but it may be an, uh, an idea for future research. They do have a uh, refuse pile. The whole city of David, the western, uh, the eastern hill is covered with trash left from the second temple uh, period uh, festivals, gatherings of the Shalosh Regalim. And I wonder how many oil lamps are there. And if you could statistically, now you need, a, you need somebody who knows geology and somebody who knows statistics. If you could find out if you are getting these lamp takers or lamp lighters and to try to identify them. Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's it's pretty interesting. I'm not a specialist in oil lamps at all. These are oil lamps that people send to me to take a look at, and we've tried a variety of different tools. But we've even expanded over to uh, Greece into the Jewish communities there, particularly on roads, and mm -hmm. looking at some of the same. I mean, if you show if you took a look at it, you wouldn't tell the difference between what you found at Bethsaida or what you'd find up in Jerusalem at the same time period, right? We're talking turn of the strength, you know, early Roman. And you can't tell the difference. And we were pleasantly surprised that the same breakup um, in Zirconium, right, in Stranium, the same breakup as you'd find in Jerusalem, right, were there. So people are going from Rhodes or and taking these home as, I'll say, souvenirs, or as you saying, ritual lighting and then taking them, or taking them home for Shabbat, um, or just as a souvenir. You know, you've got these multiple ideas. Uh, but they, that Jewish community had a strong, you could say, affinity to having these Jerusalem-sourced Herodian oil lamps. And I thought, you know, it's not an area that I'm huge into, but I think it's fascinating when people propose these kinds of things and it's, you know, and I need to work with someone who understands that the oil lamp end of things, uh, because we, you know, some of the results I think are saying, you know, where is the oil? And I was interesting that you've got an oil lamp factory, right? They're making it there. Correct. Um, you know, yeah, I think, I think that's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks a lot. It was a great talk. Binyamin, just I would like if anybody else has a comment or a question. I, I do have a question before we finish. So if anybody else has a question, now's a good time to ask. Um, how many approximately how many first temple and second temple lamps have been found? Do you have any idea? I know where to go to find the answer. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and, and only that and only that up to date uh, to a certain date. Um, I just as uh, in many fields, there's a, a researcher who paves the way. A lot of my research was uh, who paved the way for this is a researcher named Varda Zusman. She dedicated her life to the study of oil amps and has published literally four books on the subject, each dedicated to a different period. She has one that is dedicated to the early oil lamps, the saucer lamps, the uh, the pinched lamps if you that I showed you at the beginning. Uh, there she also has a corpus of where they've been found, um, but it's in the hundreds if not thousands. Um, they're very, very, very common, uh, maybe even tens of thousands. More common than coins. Definitely more common than with Iron a, Age with coins. A, with a longer period of utilization. Sure. So my, my question, uh, Binyamin, um, as it relates to uh, the oil lamps is you discussed 
the molds being made out of stone, do we have oil lamps that are made out of stone? Because obviously they, they wouldn't be made in a mold, but right, if, if we're dealing with issues of pu ritual purity and impurity, right, do we see lamps that are actually chiseled out of stone? There are two that I know of offhand, one of which is in the Israel Museum that is a Herodian lamp. It's exact, it's the stone prototype, I guess you will, of a, it's not a mold, it's a lamp. It's, um, it is in the Israel Museum. There are stone lamps from uh, proto-historic times which they were used as ad hoc uh, lamps. Um, I, stone was not a good uh, material for burning. Um, when limestone heats up, it has a tendency to crack. Um, so I guess you can have the Mahadrin Aleph Aleph oil lamp. Those who, who want to be for sure that they don't have any impurities in their lamp may use a, such a lamp. Um, I live, uh, there was excavations just not far from my house over the summer, they published uh, the findings. They found a stone incense shovel. Uh, I know the bronze incense shovel, but this is the first time I've, they also found a stone table. These are vessels that are known to be made out of stone, but for the first time I've saw some heat, uh, heating yeah. vessel uh, made out of stone. Um, of course, in later periods, steatite from Yemen was being imported uh, and being converted into lamps during the Islamic period. That we have, so and it's no sixth, seventh century, you have tons of stone lamps, but they're being, in, they're part of the Islamic production. Um, um, but this is a point that uh, I think that the stone uh, production of lamp, uh, the stone molds, and maybe it didn't come out uh, so clear, the stone molds, um, our reaction to the, the end of wheel made production, wheel made lamp production. Uh, Harry was mentioning the, the Herodian lamps, the knife paired lamps. These are made on wheels, which are stone potter's wheels. Uh, molds, if, if a mold could be come in, in contact with impurification, some avtuma, then all the, all the lamps, produced in that mold would be impure. So that as a reaction, I think you're getting these stone molds, but it's very interesting that they continue stone molds even after uh, stone vessels are being uh, ruled out. Uh, we have a continuation in the gallery of stone vessels. Uh, we have stone ossuaries that continue into the middle Roman period and the late Roman period. Um, but uh, I think this is a carryover, I think, um, there's something in the craft, the chain de apertoire of lamp, because of the impurities and the purification uh, laws, that's just the way they're no, they're, they make lamps. Now in the Beit Natif lamps, you see it very well. I told you about the nozzle up direction, the stone molds, they're making Israel modified lamps something that would be, would find favor in the eyes of the local production. Here I, I have on this, here it is. These are the small hold versions. I did mention again, I would we'd have to give three Zoom talks to talk about all this, but these products apparently never, uh, they've never been found anywhere, but the cisterns at Baramki, meaning they weren't a very high market success. Whereas these, the wide oil lamps are literally found everywhere. If that has something to do with the impurities or impurities and the, the, the coins going through or not, or... Um, Pruta is not very big, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so th that, I mean, we're getting, this is what I wanted to show. What's, what, what would we define as a Jewish lamp? And so to that, we really have to go um, halacha and to look through the Mishnah and to look at it not in its traditional form, but to see between the lines, not to learn out what the behind the lines of the Mishnah, but take it at face value and try to see what they're literally telling us. And with the artifacts as data set, 
uh, and not to cast modern uh, references um, backwards. Well, you know, we're human. And so we tend to like superimpose our modern conceptions of things on the past. And oftentimes we're a little surprised when we discover that it's not exactly like that. Uh, Binyamin, I want to thank you. Barney, I want a few words and, and a wrap up, please. Binyamin, this was fantastic. You took us from the macro over history to the micro over specific dig with its specific insights and then back into the halacha that was very valuable. I went to Ner Yisrael Yeshiva. I'm reasonably sure that the entire time I was at Ner Yisrael Yeshiva, including when I learned the Talmud and Brachos about Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai being called Ner Yisrael, I had no idea Ner was a lamp. <laughs> so I, I, I constantly- The wax candle, everybody knows that. You're right, and I constantly fight uh, with my, with our rabbi and in class, and recently uh, he said, "Yes, a lamp, lamp, yes, lamp." Uh, I attributed to Telzu Shiva and my when I was growing up, sending out uh, over one hundred and fifty thousand blue boxes of candles a year, so people knew Neiros Hanukkah were wax candles. Um, I liked very much what you said about it being a production center. I live in the old city of Jerusalem. You walk by Arab stores selling talitot, selling mezuzot, selling mezuzot cases, selling shofarot, right? And that's very common because there's a market here. That's what they want. And there are Jews in the square in Rome selling uh, figurines of Jesus because, and, and it's a long time Jewish family. So that it was produced for the market, whoever they may be and however they like it, makes a lot of sense. I would say that if I lived overseas and I could take the lamp that I got in Jerusalem and then continue using that for Shabbat or having that piece, that would be a, pardon me, I can't help it, a delightful souvenir. So that makes sense to me but uh, we need a little bit more proof, but it makes sense. So this was very valuable. We usually are traveling overseas and doing a Torah archeological pro uh, program in the community with scholars that come in from the ASER conference. You were the scholar in residence for Torch uh, 2020. And I wanna thank you very much. I'm sure that many educators are going to use it because this is recorded and will be shared. And for those of you here and those who will be hearing in the, in the next while uh, Professor Larry Schiffman is going to join us on Wednesday, February 3rd at 7 p.m. Israel time to talk about a subject which he says, I never addressed that topic. What is the value of the Dead Sea Scrolls and what we've learned from them for Jewish educators in the classroom, which is Foundation Stone's Torch program main focus. So again, Benjamin Storchen of the Israel Antiquities Authority, it's always a pleasure watching you explain things with vim and with vigor and with excitement that affects the whole populace of Israel when you're on the news. And now we got a chance to share it in, in the educational world. And thank you to David Wilner for setting this up and for all those of you who joined us live. Thank you very much. Everybody have a warm winter, stay healthy. And uh, I'll put out uh, the information about the Schiffman presentation as we get a little bit closer to the date. Lila Tov from Jerusalem and from all of Israel. Thank you. It was wonderful, wonderful program. Much appreciated.